So far we have seen the theory of implantation, we have also seen the profiles which uh, ions can get into the silicon or for that matter any material. Uh, this, uh, uh, cop this sheets are taken from website from Sharifa University of Iran. I hope some of you may be knowing someone is here from that university. Those who are doing their projects, probably many of them may be knowing there is someone who is here in our faculty who is from Iran on same university. Uh, so I was just uh, once thought what is her university, so I found this slide, so I just thought it is a good ph photographs, okay. okay. We are trying to do something what is an ion implanter. The basic ion implanter is something like this. Uh, we have a source of impurities which is normally in the gaseous form. For example, in the case of boron, we have boron fluoride BF3. In the case of uh, arsenic, it is arsine. In the case of phosphorus, it is phosphine. Okay or in the case of antimony or any other, you have to first create its gaseous source, okay. Now this gas is then such as BF3 or arsene, arsene uh, you know, it is accelerated at high potential through in, in a chamber which is shown here and as this gas inlet starts in, uh, there is a large electric field which actually breaks this ions into uh, BF3 breaks into fluorine as well as boron ions. Now if we get arsenic, boron or antimony or phosphorus, I have an ion of either of these species along with hydrogen, okay. So first thing is I must separate uh, arsine or anything from or some part may not be even ionized. So there will be some gases which are unionized there will be some hydrogen and some species which you want to implant and there will be some impurities as well in the gas stream. Now since I want only one impurity to come out, okay, that is I want arsenic to be implanted, so the chamber may have all kinds of uh, ions, but I must take out only one of them which I want to implant. Okay. So we see that is called mass analyzer, so we will see what is it, mass analyzer. So I must somehow get out of this whole magnetic system which we will show you, discuss only those species which I want, okay. And that when it comes out, then I accelerate them by large electric fields, then there is a deflecting system, scan system, which is also electromagnetic system. And the beam then moves along accelerated ions are beam along and there is a wafer holder here on which they impinge, okay. So few things you have to understand that the first thing I must get some kind of a source of impurities in a gaseous form. So let us say I have a solid form, okay fine then there may be a crucible inside you actually heat, okay and see to it that you get vapors or gaseous form. These are then introduced in this chamber called plasma chamber and in this large electric field breaks the gas and it releases ions. These ions then pass through a magnet which is electromagnet as shown here and somehow bend only those ions which I want, okay. Rest will be hit elsewhere and only in the slit only those ions which I am looking for probably will pass through they will be passed through a large electric field, so they get accelerated, ions get energy from the electric field and they essentially get half mv square which is kinetic energy which essentially is equal to qv, okay, energy of the due to electric fields. So if we go through this, they will accelerate it, large energies, this is what it, it acquires energies. So you say I want 10 kV, 100 kV, 300 kV, it is this acceleration system which is typically a periodic uh, system which accelerate these ions to an energy of your choice, okay, maybe any amount you can. Of course larger the energy this, this electric fields here will be very high 
and any transforming system which puts may not be able to stand that high voltages. So therefore no more than 300, 400 kV implanters can be made easily, not impossibly. Then of course as I said there is a standard deflecting system, uh, you have done through this on all CRT systems, you have magnetic fields and electric fields which can scan the beam X and Y, okay. And this beam passes and there is a place where the wafers are uh, kept, it is called Faraday cup, okay. It was given an honor to Faraday, okay. So why it was given? Because this tube kind of system is essentially a normal cathode to anode kind of electron going or ions going from one place to the other and that has a Faraday discharge system. So the place where ions are picked up on the wafer is essentially called Faraday cup. Okay, so and of course there is a positioner where we can actually change the position of wafers in the sense the beam itself can be scanned or some mechanical motion also can be given to the wafer holders, okay. We will show you the checks which we have. So this is typically what an ion implanter does, okay. So few things one must understand that how only one kind of particle, one kind of ions only come out and uh, how they are accelerated and how they impinge on the target wafers which may be more than 10s of 20s or 100s. Okay. There must be some wafer feed mechanism through which, uh, why wafer feed because uh, please remember gas can only be ionized if there is a low pressure, okay. The gases can be only ionized if there is a lower pressure. So typically pressure may be the order of 10 to power minus 3 tar. How is tar related to atmospheric pressure? 760 tar is one atmospheric pressure, 1335 pascals is one tar. So there are six units of pressures, okay. So look for I may give any unit, okay. Well, I may give a change also, okay. Don't worry. So typically this is 10 to the power minus 3. Vacuums are normally expressed in terms of their pressures, which is torsalis, tors, and uh, one can see from here that needs some kind of evacuation system called vacuum system. So this chamber has to be and it has to be evacuated by pumps. So there are two kinds of pump, rotary pump followed by diffusion pump. If you want much lower vacuums then you will have to put some kind of cryo pumps or some kind of turbo pumps. But as of now diffusion pump can go up to 10 to power minus 6 tors. So that is sufficient for an implanter. If you go to the lab, uh, all rotary pumps are kept outside, but diffusion pumps are sitting just below the vacuum system. Okay. So a rotary pump uh, is required to start a diffusion pump. At least it should give some tar, lower tar. Then only diffusion pump starts acting. Okay. Some other day, when I'll show you actually evaporation, I may show you what is the diffusion pump. So this is a machine. The only relevant parts have been shown here. It is the same thing what I said. This is an ion source, there is an analyzer, there is an accelerator, there is a scan horizontal vertical scanner, and this is the wafer target. So, this is the brief what an implanter is trying to do. You start with an ion source, pass through a magnet, which is electromagnet, which is analyzer, and then it, you get a particular ions you actually accelerate and focus using this vertical and horizontal scanners and a pointed beam is actually hitting the target. Uh, these are all electromagnetic lenses which is actually, actually can focus any ion beam. So this is typically an ion implanter is, is a machine works. Maybe if I have a figure, I just quickly show you. You can see this is a 20 by 10, 20 by 15 kind of a room which can take care of one implanter. Larger the energy implanter you want and larger the ion mass you are, okay, you will have larger magnets, so larger area, larger acceleration tube length has to be larger. So everything becomes larger as you large ion numbers, you want large energies and you also want large mass ions to be separated. So larger the everything will also require larger space. A typical implanter room is of this size actually. Uh, this is the panel and this is that chuck you can see from here. On that chuck right now for example they are shown some 12 or 14 wafers. 
can see from here. So, what is the throughput at a time I can at best put 12 wafers or 14 wafers in a any other diffusion furnace 200 is the minimum lot. So, I can push diffusion for 200 here 12, 14, 16. Of course, nowadays there are chucks which are 48, but 48 means such big 8 inch wafer think of it 48. So, how much implanter will be large enough it should be able to scan such a large lengths and widths. So, huge money okay, huge power. This is what an implanter looks like. Uh, the next, as I say we look into be each part, the first is the plasma source. Typically I have just now said a plasma chamber you have a gas feed from here and you have a pump system which evacuates the chamber okay. And one can apply electric field be external voltage here between the plates and this this. And as you actually start ionizing the gas there is a slit here which also should have some electric field so that ions can which kind of field it should be a positive ions have to come out negative charge uh, plate must come so that they are accelerated outside okay. So, there is another chamber out which has the negatively biased so ions come out. Now t as I say the pressure inside this chamber is around 10 to power minus 4 to 10 to power minus 2 torr and ion source is characterized by ion current density. This D distance is essentially between the extractor and the source. This is called extractor. So, from extractor to the slit, the distance is called D. So, the ion current density is 5.5 .5, 10 to the power minus 8 external voltage, whatever extractor voltage I am. Extractor means which extracts the ion out, okay. Is that clear? Extractor. So, this extractor voltage to the power 3 by 2 D square, the gap to the m to the power half and its units of course are ampere per centimeter square. Please remember the area is not very large here, slits are very thin, small. So, the currents are relatively larger, okay. So, if you have a larger currents, uh, the cost of implanter increases. Typically, it can be say 100, 1 milliamp or uh, 1 amp current implanter would be cheaper than 10 amps and 100 amps, okay. The larger the ion current density you are looking out, larger will be the cost of the equipment which you require, okay. So, typically I can decide the decision of ion density is decided by what extractor voltages I am allowed, what is the distance between slit out and the external extractor the, uh, chamber and of course the mass of the ions which you are taking out, okay. which ion like arsenic is 72 or 73, phosphorus 31. So, depends on which species or boron is 11. So, which species is taking out that will decide the ion current density. D is the distance between slit to the extractor chamber. This is the from slit to the extractor is the D. Okay, so, the first part is ionize the gas and extract out ions. The next part is as I said this plasma chamber have all kinds of possible impurity gases along with the, so you thought that you have got all ultra pure gas introduced, but the species which you are introducing arsene or this may be ultra pure, but ultra pure is only say 6, 9 or 8, 9 impurities that means there is a res residual impurities. The chamber itself is made of steel so it itself degasses, so it also releases impurities. And uh, there are many other source of impurities inside and there may be small amount part per billion or less than part per billion, but they are there. But I do not want any one of them to come out of the slit that is what I am really looking. But they will right now extractor will pull all ions whichever ion is there it will pull out okay. Now these ions I want to somehow now see that only species, species of my choice comes out okay. So, I pass through a magnetic system. Let us look at a electromagnet, maybe first sheet again. Okay, this is a electromag cylindrical electromagnet and uh, since it is a magnet is taken in a ring form, it has a radii of curvature. It says radius of curvature is known, the magnet size and its radius of curvature is actually known to me. Okay. Now, this means if an ion is entering this magnetic field, 
it will experience magnetic field for magnetic force what is that force called lorentz force and since it is passing it has also accelerated and it has a mass it has a kinetic energy of half mv square which was also equal to qv external voltage extractor voltage that's the energy which you gave them okay when they pass through a this slit uh, through a mag magnet they will be actually passing through and they will have a motion which is which receives a force called centrif centrifugal force so it actually moves in a direction which is decided by mv square by r v is the velocity okay which must be balanced by the lorentz force which is velocity cross b or vx b, bz if x is the direction of motion across orthogonal to that is the magnetic field so v is qv cross b mv square by r by solving all this i can get a term r is the radius of curvature b into b is the magnetic flux uh, available with this it is expressed in gauss uh, what what does gauss means how much lines per square inch 6.4 uh, magnetic lines magnetic force lines per square inch is the density which is equal to one gauss value okay okay so if i calculate b into r is the radius of curvature where mv square by r is r is the radius of curvature through which they are bending okay so if b into r is 2 qv external by m divided by qm qq will cancel so it actually can be written as 4.55 under root m times p ext extractor voltage now this b into r is essentially called magnetic rigidity and that is the feature of any permanent magnet this has nothing to do with this but there is another small br anyone has uh, done uh, second years well i hope so there is a br of a magnet which is small r not capital r what is it that's what just now i said br is the magnetic flux density or so many lines per square uh, per square inch or per centimeter square that is if i plot a br bh curve okay maybe it is bit of sorry what do you do this will be hysteresis this is so the maximum value of this is br what is this value called sc what is sc x is the magnetization current density at which the magnetization becomes zero okay hc these are the numbers which are given for a given magnets okay and the whatever energy store is b cross h inside this bh curve okay some other time since i have designed a permanent magnet motor way back i have studied lot many magnetic systems okay so once of course so this br and that br should not be confused this is r is the radius of curvature so if r is fixed for the magnet is that clear if r is fixed for the magnet i can now say that this magnetic intensity b or magnetic flux density b is proportional to root of mass is that clear everything else is if i keep extractor fixed this is constant r is constant so b is proportional to root of m m means atomic mass or atomic weight of that species so if i want this any species to come through radius of curvature of r which is fixed by me all that i have to do is to adjust b which means the curve and how do i adjust b b is proportional to what how do i if i have a core which is normally iron or steel and i put a wire around what's the law it follows ampere's law if n is the number of turns i is the current flowing in this in the coil n i mu by l l is the length of the coil so n i mu mu is the permeability n i mu by l is the magnetic flux which it can receive this is ampere's law very old ampere's law so this simple ampere's law tells us how much is the magnet so what is that other things are constant so what b will change i since r the everything is fixed for electromagnet 
all that I change is the current in the electromagnetic coil and that decides my B. If that decides my B, that decides my M. Is that correct? For a given B, there is only one M is possible come through R. Okay. So, if I want arsenic, so I figure out if so much ampere per uh, this current I pass through this coil, so many amperes, this arsen arsenic will come. I change the current, boron may come. I change the current, phosphorus may come. Is that clear? So, all that I do is fixed currents are available known to us at for each species which I want to take out. Is that clear? However, if you want to change further, if you change the extractor voltage which you are not allowed, but there are systems in which these days they allow extractor voltage to change, then the BR changes and then the different currents you have to plan wet currents now I should have. Uh, this reason is there are two reasons, it is called pre acceleration and post acceleration. V ex uh, extractor will accelerate ions, then there is accelerating voltage also further <coughs> ahead of it. So, how much pre acceleration should be done and how much should be post? there may be additional post acceleration, pre acceleration system. So, nowadays it is decided that this voltage itself is variable, you can actually vary it, okay. but then your currents will also proportionately different for different M because B will be varying for that, is that clear. So, B has to be changed corresponding to M required and that is how called mass analysis, is that correct? This system is called mass analyzer, so any species may come. But through the radio curvature which has a slit inside the magnet only one species will come out because you have fixed a current through which only it will bend through R. Okay. This normal angle is 45 degree uh, around like this, but it can be 60 degree then you will have to recalculate how much you have where do you want to take it out. But there is no harm of any angles generally it is 45 degree which you move your ions come and then through 45 degree they become 90, 45, 45. Okay. So, normally at 90 degree it moves out. Okay. Now, how do I know that which gas is coming also? So, I can actually take a spectra through a mass, uh, I do not know how much your chemistry there is a infrared spectra can be obtained and I can see for spectra for each of the gases spectra this. So, I know if I have a gas I want this specific species, please remember these are isotopes of BF3s, there will be fluorine, there will be BF2, there will be so these which species also is to be decided through what is the maximum mass it is going to give us that you will have to evaluate a priori. Okay. So, this spectra for each gas I get it, first I get the spectra for it for phosphine system, boron, uh, boron system as well as for, uh, of course these are provided by the people who will supply you gas, you do not have to analyze. These analytical graphs are always provided to know which species has what amount of uh, gas or what amount of impurities or other, other spectra it has. Okay. Now this, the next of course of, as I said you, after I know which species I analyzed, I also know I have passed through magnet, I got one species out and then I apply uh, some kind of a ion acceleration through electric fields, electric field coils are shown here, you have a this is called resolving aperture, then you have to maintain certain amount of pressure inside okay, and you accelerate the ions to a, what is the acceleration? Kinetic energy is Q times V ex extractor plus V which you now apply, is that how much energy it will pick up? Q into V extractor plus whatever V accelerating voltage now you will apply. So, net energy now is Q V X plus V, v up, you are further apply. Okay. So, that is the net energy and that energy is what is provided to the ions. Is that clear? I repeat, you already accelerated partly extra through extractor. So, extractor plus additional voltage which you apply. Q into that is the energy which ions will actually receive. So, for example, they are given a example if external voltage is 30 k, extractor is 30 kV, then I apply accelerated voltage of 70 kV and the ion will have energy of 100 kV. So, this that is why I say nowadays this also is adjustable okay, in some implanters. 
V extractor is already, already yeah, extracted out plus whatever accelerating voltage you will put Q V x plus V accelerator is the net energy this ion will receive. Okay. So, you are energetic ions okay, which are coming out. Okay. Is that okay? Gas is ionized, accelerated by extractor voltage, passed through magnet, re accelerated and you are ions of specific ions with a given energy which you want to actually want to implant on. Okay. Is it okay? Then you have a XY scanner, this is a vertical scan and this is a horizontal scan. Right now it is both electrostatic but it could be magnetic as well. And then there is a some kind of a chuck where these wafers are holding, okay, maybe this system is also decided with the current of ions which you are actually picking up. Is that correct? Larger currents will require larger deflections because so many ions. What does that mean? Number of ions per centimeter square will be very high, current density is higher. So, now you will require much higher voltages to deflect them out, okay. Smaller currents, smaller displacements, okay, smaller number of ions. So, this is something a deflecting system which you will have to design for a given amperage which you want. Okay. What is the current to do something is more important because why we are constantly talking of current. I have first day talked about but let us say again why are we worried about current in the implanters. Okay. What does current means? It essentially measures the ions per unit time moving, is it it? That is the current. So, larger the current means larger number of ions are flowing through this. Okay. So, the um, number of ions which will impinge silicon will be larger, larger current means number of ions will be impinging in a larger numbers okay. and that is what we want to say. How much, what word we say dose, how many impurities I want to push in it per unit area is decided by current which I will pass through, okay. is it okay? okay. So, here is the last part of the implanter. Uh, the ion beam is coming, there is some kind of a cylindrical system which is called the Faraday cup or Faraday chamber. Please remember in earlier version the wafer holder, how do you measure the current? As the ions strike the wafer, since they are charged and if the wafers are grounded, then the charge flows through and current is monitored, is that correct? So, this is the emitter which I have shown here, this is how the current is monitored. But as the ions keeps coming, this current will be also time function, is that correct? It is a time function. And what I need at a after a given time, I want to see how many impurities have gone in per centimeter square, okay. That is called dose. So, you say 1 upon Q A 0 to T dash is the time for which implantation was performed, I T D T. So, what is this circuit will be, should be? An integrator, an integrator is required to actually find the dose, is that clear? Integral I D T is essentially used a integrator there. So, this integrator along with this is a constant we know Q A which is scaled down directly. So, direct measurement on a meter you can see how many, how much is the dose. Q A is fixed because you know area where the beam will strike, how much area? And you also know this integrator will actually integrate the I T D T is what exchange essentially? I charge per unit time, is that correct? So, this is the net charge received, is that correct? This is the net charge received, okay, per unit area, of course. Is that correct? Ion will give only charge, okay. Monitored is current, okay. So, this is how actually we, we involve. So, normally how do I know or can I keep monitoring what is the dose? No, there will be some kind of comparator. You fix your dose value for a given voltage equivalent and you keep monitoring this, not you monitor, it will, you fix that value and when you turn on, when the comparator will switch off the ion source whenever that dose is same as this. This is a very simple technique which allows you to actually fix the dose, okay. So, you set the dose start ion implanter and after when the dose is same as what you said, the machine will switch off. So, is that point clear? So, what is an ion implanter? Essentially, I can put number of and dose has been in our case, what is the name we gave for dose? NS. In our profile, 
NS is the dose we were talking about in the Gaussian profile okay. and what is the value we said integral NX DX minus infinity to plus infinity is the amount of impurity per unit area gone in. So that is the dose is that clear? So any profile should be integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity because a Gaussian goes to minus infinity to plus infinity. So this do, I, as I did you get the point how do I fix the dose? I actually said one of the comparator value of fixed dose whatever I want. Then the integrator gives output correspondingly and it keeps comparing with the set value. As soon as the set value matches that the comparator change the state and switch off the creates a pulse which switch off the ion source. Okay. So we automatically dose stops I mean uh, implantation stops. So this is what ion implanter is all about and what is the advantage of ion implantation we said impurities can be put below surface is that clear gosh any other diffusion it starts from the surface there is no other way I can do that is that clear. So the first thing I got an advantage that I can go below the surface anywhere I can fix the dose at any position. Some device I said I want lower concentration I mean higher concentration in the lower side and lower concentration in the higher side that is also possible called hyper abrupt because I can put impurities higher dose below lower dose above I can change. I can take any arbitrary profile you give me this is the profile I want I can adjust number of uh, multiple implants and I will give any kind of profiles okay. I can adjust any amount of dose by adjusting the time okay will have some damage so I will anneal that damage and I also expect during that impurities will also get into substitution sites. So essentially ion implanter has replaced solid state diffusion as a source of impurity but after impurities are gone in it still follows diffusion law please remember DT product is not neglect DT is same. So the diff why we talk so much about solid state diffusion because we, we were looking for diffusion as a theory. The source we used that time was constant source or limited source but we actually looked into how impurities get into silicon or diffuse into silicon. Implantation only does one job to put a fixed amount of impurities per centimeter square at a place where you want okay. that is the only difference between the two however energy smaller and lighter can also decide or heavier can decide how much is the depth you want okay. That is the another advantage I can decide just below so much all impurities at the surface slightly below much below these are the advantages which ion, ion implant allows at the solid state diffusion wave uh, furnaces with the 4 stack 4 tubes may cost around 30, 40 lakhs rupees okay not even dollars and ion implanter may cost 30 million dollars. So that is the kind of money which you have to understand. Uh, so if I are doing in my lab I may not buy implanter I may still work with solid state diffusion. Theek hai device itna achha nahi hai. Okay. So this so far we have discussed now almost all this there are two or three more processes which I have to do first before I start uh, other thing but I thought that should wait and I should first show you how the ICs are made because that is the purpose of this course is to show I, how the IC fab flow is. So we will first do this and wherever that word deposition comes yeah I can do it I will say it, yeah I can do it okay and then we will look back we have to see physical vapor depositions we have to see chemical vapor depositions and we have to look into etching okay. Can you think etching and depositions are same? After if I etch something this material will go somewhere if it deposits somewhere else so that is the deposition this is etching okay. Identical same thing I will use it okay. Kahin se hata ke kahin aur dal denge bala ye deposit ho gaya nahin niche niche ho gaya okay. 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 Let us start today and maybe tomorrow I hope I will be able to finish. I want to see the process flow of an IC making particularly using CMOS okay. Okay so we start with IC processing and as I said there are two process modes deposition these are layer but we assume we know and continue with this okay. 
So, this is the crux of the course, this is what we are trying to learn and to do this whatever processes we have to do we will do that. Okay. So, we have learned so far 3, 4, 1 and maybe 2 are still remaining okay. which is the major step in the case of India circuit lithography, lithography if you cannot print correctly all your game is over okay. So, that is the major crux why I am keep telling in exam also lithography. I will just talk about basic process given in plumber's book and uh, of course at the end maybe after the other two process time permitting I will also show you how finfets are actually fabbed. Okay. Why finfets? Because well, most mass transistors are now replaced by at least uh, 3D if not 3D at least normal finfets with at least few fins. Okay. Choice of substrate, first thing you have to do is substrate choice. MOS circuits are normally 100 oriented wafers, bipolars normally use 111 wafers. Okay. Why? 90 percent bipolar transistor action is vertical, is that correct? Base emitter, base collector. Okay. MOS transistor is always lateral. So, look for mobilities which direction it is maximum and therefore utilize it for your advantage. Also of course there is many other reasons of bipolar using 111s. I do not have time otherwise I will show you bipolar process is even more interesting and little more difficult also. Okay. But since it is not having enough market I think we will go for MOS. Typical doping of the substrate is around 5 to 50 cent ohm centimeter. Uh, it is better to have a larger uh, I mean wafers of higher uh, disk or other it should be more intrinsic lower the sheet resistance it is better okay. If the wafer are intrinsic sometimes it is better but intrinsic is too bad and uh, too difficult and too costly so we do not buy. Why intrinsic wafers are costly? What is that intrinsic means? No impurities. So you will have to purify a wafer for almost all impurities out that takes money. So, Fz crystals are costlier than Cz crystals by two orders 100 times because it removes impurities. Okay. I keep telling you money because you must realize why certain companies do only this much and certain do not they do not do it because their volumes are such that they cannot afford. Okay. The wafers are normally P type boron, boron doped lightly doped essentially. And for a typical 0.25 micron process which what plumber is working about the concentration is around 10 to power 15 per cc. Then there is a EDP count what is it? It is essentially called electronic defect count which is expressed as number per centimeter square. Uh, the wafers one expects are less one defect per centimeter square is what is expected. No one will get this but if you have one you pay for it. What is it to do with uh, why we should have a low EDP counts? The number of chips on a wafer will be proportional to how many defects are on, on a crystal. Okay. So, those many having a defect will not be working. So, the either paisa bachaoge, udhar loss mein jaoge. So, you have to think how much money. The fourth is the wafer size and the thickness of the wafer. Please remember wafer sizes are decided by companies throughput requirements 8 inch wafers, 10 inch for 12 inch wafers and now people are looking for 16 inch wafers okay one wafer of 16 inch. Uh, I have worked from half inch wafers, 1 inch wafers, 2 inch wafers, 3 inch wafers, 4 inch wafers and then I did not work okay. So, so best I have used is 4 inch wafers but nowadays they are talking of 16 inch wafers. Why they are looking for higher size? More chips out of one same processing because gas ek bar andar dala to nahi hai, theek hai. So, throughput may be better. Okay. Of course, reliability is also issue. The first thing we, are, we actually go through is called active area for the transistors. Okay. Now, let me <laughs> Actually, before I come to this, just a minute. First, let me get rid of this implant sheets. Okay. What we are really trying to do is the something following like this. 
Of course, this is rudimentary, I am not showing fully. Okay, just a minute, I will I'll come back to it, I will just try to show you what is what about. Then I want some oxide, right now I am not showing you how, I will do this. This is of course, there, then there is a metallization, also has to be metallization here, here, here and here and of course, from the gate. This is a CMOS process which I want to create, okay. that is my job. I want to have an N channel device, I also want to have a P channel device. And of course, I may connect one of these two to make a common complementary part in that. And I must, one thing, important thing is each area of N channel should be separated from the P channel because the substrate has to be opposite. So, this is done in the area which is called P well, this is done in the A P devices are made in the area which is N well. Okay. Uh, I also want each transistor be separated from the other one. Okay. So, this is called isolation. So, they must get isolated from each other. Okay. So, the process which I need to know is isolation. This re region where actually transistor appears is called active area. Is that clear? Wherever transistor occurs, that area is called active area. So, the first mask is the one to create where transistors are going to come and where the other part get isolated from these areas. Is that clear? I want one transistor here, one transistor here, in between something should block so that they do not connect to each other. Okay. So, this is what essentially first mask will do. It will allow me to have individual transistor area isolated okay. and that is called active area mask. Is that okay? So, standard CMOS will go through and as the, uh, it is only 2 metal process they are done. If you have a 7 metal process, another 5 mask. So, 16 plus 5 is only if same process with only additional metals. If you add any other extra things, it will keep increasing the number of masks. So, we will actually look into 16 mask process and then we will say, ye karna hai ek mask. Active areas are the regions where mass transistors will be created. Okay. All transistors need to be separated and process which allows this is called isolation. The first mask is used to have used to delineate active areas. I am in a silicon wafer, I want these are the transistor area. Please remember I am only showing you cross sections, but in actually where will be the wafer will be something like this. So, one transistor will be here, one will be here, one will be here, one will be here. So, it is the plan where number of transistors are will be actually there, but where, where I will see it? Only on this side, okay, cross section. Okay. So, the first mask as I said is to delineate active area, delineate means separate. Okay. I said and the mask is therefore many times called active area mask is called active area mask or some people call it isolation mask. Isolation is provided by thick oxide. The easiest way to separate transistors are through thick oxide. Why oxide? Current cannot pass through insulators, that is the hope. There are two process of creating this oxide. Of course, process is same, but one is called low cost process, which is old one process, slightly modified version is the second one. The first process which creates, uh, which is called, what is low cost means? Local oxidation of silicon, which can create two kinds of figures, very interesting figures, uh, if you see on the cross section. One is called bird's beak, the other is called bird's crest. Okay. Now, it looks like that, that is why the names. 
But of course nowadays uh, slightly different isolations have been tried in a lower down technologies and they actually created trench isolations, shallow trench isolations which is called STI. So almost every new technology will have STI isolations, not just Burke Beak or Burke's Crest. Okay. Not much different, not much different, but there is diff little extra processing has been done in the second one. Why, why this was tried? Because this was not able to isolate because this oxide thickness could not be very thick. So between two transistors there was still some leakage paths. So I said okay, I said not deep oxide dal dota hai ki idhar se udhar koi dekhe hi na usko. Okay. okay, so we start with the first one. I uh, will do first this process. Is it okay? Two possible ways of doing it. Of course, process is still local oxidation. One earlier version we used to do what is called creating locas and we used to create bird's crest or bird's beak. Both have some problems. The second one nowadays we actually only do STIs. Okay. Here is the flow. They start looking in the way I start. Only one figure I you first draw whichever I am discussing then draw the second one. The first is you start with silicon. Okay and grow thin oxide on that. Please draw the figure because this is the only way you can learn. Please draw the figure. You have a silicon substrate which is thermally oxidized Si plus O and dry oxidation. Si plus O2 is SiO2. Typically 400 Armstrongs of oxide was used for 0.25 micron process. This thicknesses will be only true for 0 0.25, 0 0.35 processes, 90 nanometer down their values are different, 45 it is even very different, 12, 22 it is even very different. So do not use same values for all nodes, okay. but this anyway is the process will remain same, not much different in the next device also. Okay, so the first oxide which I grow is called pad oxide, okay. something padding is to be done, so I said okay, I call it pad over which the second figure now you draw. I have a silicon, I have a silicon dioxide and I deposit silicon nitride. I deposit silicon nitride. What do I deposit? Silicon nitride. The reaction is 3 SiH4, SiH4 is silane. Three SiH4 plus 4 in H3 using a low pressure CVD system at around 600 to 800 degree centigrade, maybe 800. I can deposit silicon nitride plus hydrogen will be released in the ambient. Okay. Typical nitride thickness for, please remember these numbers are taken from Plummer's book and that technology is 0 0.25 to 0.35. So otherwise do not go by these numbers are valid numbers. For 22 nanometers when I show you a fin at least for 45, these numbers I will tell you what are they are using now. Okay. So the second step is, first is pad oxide. On the top I, what is the process now? It is not growth. This was silicon converted to SiO2. Now I am depositing silicon nitride by reaction this, this process will show low pressure CVD, chemical vapor depositions. So we, this is what we are not done. Deposition etching we are not done, but we will do that. Then after this deposition is done, I coat this with photoresist. Coat is by either by dispensing by tube or by dispenser called diffuser and then spinning the vapor on the chuck. Okay. This is deposition plus spin and I get a thin layer of photoresist which can be different thinking. If I want thicker, what is the way I can change the thickness of resist? Spinning speed. Larger the spinning speed, thinner will be the resist layer. Okay. But too small a speed also has a problem. Liquid does not dry out. Too thick a resist, actually the lower part does not dry. Okay. Then it creates bubbles. So there are catch words technology wise. So the third process step is 
deposition spinning layer of photo resist. Okay. Typical resist requirement may be 0 0.6 micron to 1 micron, 0 0.6 micron to 1 micron. The fourth step is the first lithography. Fourth step is the first mask has been used. Okay. If I am using a PPR, this resist is positive photo. What does the property of a positive photo resist? It is hard initially. When exposed, it becomes soft means etchable, developed, it can be developed. So, since it is a PPR and I want to retain certain areas, their light should not go. So, the mask has two windows for this two areas. This is the mask, two windows, clear field with two dark windows. The light will not pass through the dark areas and therefore, below the resist will remain hard and the wherever the light will go through the clear regions, the resist is developed out. Is that okay? PPR property is it becomes softened when it receives photons. Okay. Essentially what does it do? You have a cross links resin which actually breaks and therefore it is etchable. NPR is opposite, it is an uncross links or it is a straight chain, it cross links when it receives energy. So, unachievable. Okay, so, the fourth step we now got after using lithography which I have not shown you. How do I do this? I put this mask on the top of this, I discuss this, shine light, when the light will not pass through dark areas, these areas will become soft that can be developed and only these areas resist will remain. So, this is called patterning, first pattern has appeared, this is your pattern this has appeared. Please remember this is cross section, the y uh, z is inside, okay. this is only x y I have shown, z is inside, maybe you should show something like this. Okay. So, the after the fourth step we actually have delineation of, so what is this area is about? These areas are the areas where transistor is going to come. Is that correct? Where transistor is going to come? How, how do you decide the active area? One is channel length. What else? Source, the width is not that crucial. Source de lengths, drain lengths, some mas masking areas, edges. Okay. So, at least this three, the minimum feature size and the length, channel length, this sum of the three is essentially decide the active area. Is that clear? Active area. Channel length, source and drain, this total area is essentially where transistor is going to come. Okay. Source length must come and channel must come, gate must come. So, all three together should actually create a transistor. So, that is the area which you have delineated. So, below that only transistor will come and the rest places transistor should not be allowed to happen. That means one transistor here, one transistor here should get separated by process what we call just now as isolations. The same figure is slightly better modified. Uh, in this case, I forgot uh, after the PPR is developed, even the nitride is etched out. So, here is the fifth one. The nitride is also removed from these areas. Where the areas outside active region, I have only silicon dioxide thin layer over which the active region has nitride as well as resist, as well as resist. How to etch nitride? Nitride is agent is hydrofluoric acid which is same as for SiO2. Yeah, I mean that, that is the problem, you are right. Uh, the reason why H rate is adjusted for that. There is for SiO2 you need something called buffers. In nitrides you do not need buffers. Buffer means do not put in ammonium fluorides. For oxide you need some ammonium fluoride, okay. thin downs. Okay. So, anyway, etching, abhyanato etching, selective etching. So, I have now after this I get oxide and nitride, okay. only resist has been stripped out. What is why resist is called stripper? Because otherwise it was unachable, you said. Na? And even now I am removing, so I say it is stripped. Okay. Normally what are the stripped? 
either organics like xylene, acetones or some dark color resins like you know is uh, asphalt you use in the road making, carbon jelly that also removes resist but that is bad so we do not use it. Okay. After this I start oxidation that is the local oxidation word came now. I thin oxide, nitride active areas I started acting like a I start put this vapor into oxidation furnace. Okay. Typically it is normally this process of because this thicker oxide is required. What is this process called? Why I am saying so? Any oxidation cycle normally is weight cycle is dry, weight and dry. Initial oxide is good if you have dry oxidation, no other species. Then you want to grow, you want, do not want to waste some 20 hours, so you want a lower time, so you do weight oxidation. The final sin there will be some steam left out, so you do dry oxidation which oxygen, rest of the oxygen picks up the vapors. So always weight oxidation cycles are dry, weight, dry. Though these oxide thicknesses due to dry may be very, very small, may be few and strong compared to the weight which you are growing. Okay. As soon as I start doing oxidation, you can see this figure, oxygen does not pass through nitride, nitride is a mass for oxygen. Okay. So any oxidation cannot take place below nitride regions, is that clear? Below nitride region oxidation cannot happen. But oxygen will allow oxygen to get in, oxide is allow oxygen to grow, deal grow model. The problem now is you are holding this wafer, uh, holding this surface of nitride at one level, this level, okay. You are oxidizing, but I already told you that 0.45 micron of silicon is consumed to create one micron of SiO2. So the volume roughly doubles, is that correct? So if you consume 0.45 micron down, 0.55 must come up because you want 1 micron if totally you create, so 0.45 will go below and 0.55 will go up. Why? Because nitride is holding the surface layer, so half will go up, half will go down, so that is the shape. Is that clear? So part of the oxide is above, part of the oxide is below. Okay. Now if you look at and then you remove, strip the nitrides now. Okay. How do I remove? As I say by using this method. Is it figure? Okay, this is 5, maybe 6, 7, maybe T K B. Is that okay? how this oxidation has taken place, why it is called local, oxidation is taking place only in these regions but not in the active area. So localized oxidation has been performed, therefore low cost, local oxidation of silicon. As someone asked me, if I would have etched oxide from here also it would not have mattered, there is some advantage of retaining thin oxide, but it need not be retained because anyway I am going to do local oxidation. Is that okay? So it is not a compulsory that if nitride during etching oxide goes, is okay. But normally I will preferentially etch so that some thin oxide is maintained okay, because the new growth will be then better than fresh silicon. Okay. So I will do this preferential but if not, nothing serious happens. Okay. Is that okay? Everyone drawn figures because these are the figures which will ask you in the exam as well. So if I look at little magnified version of this, uh, I find these and then there is a thin oxide here, okay. I removed nitride from there and I see this area. So if I actually see this small area at the edges, I see this right side figure. That is essentially called bird's beak, bird's beak.
Now why this bird's beak has appeared? No, no, bird's beak appeared because when the oxidation was being performed for this, what is below there? Thin oxide. Some oxygen entered that laterally below that nitride area, okay. So it created a thin line inside the transistor area. It gives what is the problem with that? The active area is reduced, okay. Your gate length will not reduce, but source drain areas will reduce. So, what is the problem if source drain area goes down? Resistance increases, so whole your speed goes down. So, it is not trivial. I am worried about 6 gigahertz, I may lose 5, 6 to 4 by now. Okay. So, this bird's beak. So, we said, okay, why did you put a pad? I put a pad because nitro, nitride on silicon has a very bad combination. It has a different thermal coefficient of expansion. So, it does not sit very well. Okay. Its mechanical strength is different from oxide. So, I said okay, between nitride and silicon I will put a material which matches both. Okay. So, I put a thin layer of SiO2. That is why I call pad. It is like a buffer layer there. So, above is nitride, below is silicon. In between thin oxide of pad was used. But that created because there was an oxygen here, it entered from sideways as well and created some oxidation inside also. Okay. So, your active area becomes smaller relatively. Okay. Of course, these are all exaggerated things, not so bad or something, but just for the So, we say, okay, if that is all that you were looking for, then I remove the pad. So, I started with nitride without oxide, masked it everything and I have a wafer now which is active area on the nitride, okay. active area only on nitride sitting on silicon. But since their thermal coefficient of expansion is different, so when I start oxidation, this edges starts lifting. Okay. This edges because their thermal coefficient is different, the stress here is excessively high. What we say sticking coefficient goes down, okay, some other take more chemical. So, the nitride layer from the edges actually lifts off. Okay. If this lifts off and when I am now doing oxidation, from here you can see it will go up and come down. So, from that edge it will go up and then, so this portion is like a crest of the bird. So, it is called bird's crest. Why are we so worried about these shapes? Because this if area is not uniform on a one plane, the next process may be have a problem of accuracy all around. Okay. Is that okay? And then I remove the uh, nitride. So, what I got now is bird's Crest as isolating areas. Is that okay? Is that wire crest? I repeat, the lift of nitride allows oxidation to proceed like this, okay. and because of that, you see a huge top oxide, and that is called bird's crest. So this is non much non planar than this, but what is the problem here? It encroaches the active area. Here it does not. Okay, but it creates crest on so non planar surfaces. So, Abhitak, we are still not done first implant as well. What we have done so far is only to check get the active area where transistors are going to come, even then it is not over. Okay. The other possible oxidation isolation oxide isolation is done through what is called shallow trench isolation called STI. The first four or five steps are identical as we did earlier. However, I have now oxide, nitride, resist and isolated. This is same as what was done earlier for low cost. Before low cost starts, oxidation starts, this is the step which is common for both. Now, I please remember this is my initial surface where this oxide is. Is that okay? This is my initial surface, okay, silicon. I start etching silicon itself. Okay. So, if I start etching silicon, 
silicon will be seen here, will be seen here, will be seen here. So, silicon will start etching down. Now, the question is normal agents which we use, which are the liquid etching system, is isotropic in nature. What does that mean? So, shape will not be vertical, but some angle it will show 57 degree normal silicon. V, it will create a V. Here I do a process of etching which is exactly vertical which is called ion etching, okay. dry etching as the word. Wet etching is always isotropic, anisotropic etchings are done by dry etching. So we will do dry etching. So this area of silicon has been removed, this area of silicon has been removed and this area of silicon has been taken away. Okay. So now I have oxide nitride base and you have trenches sidewise. Is that clear? These islands are now sitting in, a, in the trenches, just about trenches. This depth of this trench can be a micron or even lower these days, okay, because the device is within first 1000 Armstrongs now. So you, a, even a micron is more than sufficient. So once, how do you etch silicon? Silicon has no direct etching agent. Either you do a dry etching is fine, but if I do weight etching, what is the agent for silicon could be? First, you I know HF, HS, silicon dioxide. So I must convert silicon into silicon dioxide. Nitric acid does that. Five three three uh, is the ratio. Five water, three nitric acid, three uh, HF. If I mix or 531 depends on company plus water dilution if you want 10 percent of this, these called uh, silicon agents or called RH. Now this etching will do silicon, oxidizes silicon and remove, HF removes the oxides. Okay, but in the case of this we will use only fluorine and fluorine ions to etch through. Okay. Once this is done, trenches are created. Is that okay figures? Jaha hai usko niche tak this deep trench. These are shallow but shown deep compared to this, okay. See they are called shallow trenches because it is less than a micron. Okay. Wafer is 10,000 these days millimeters and I am talking of few microns. So it is very shallow. Why one millimeter thick wafers will be required? Larger the size, larger will be thickness. Okay. okay. After etching of trenches in silicon, one removes resist by stripping. Okay. And you have then oxide nitride, oxide nitride. After this, then I oxidize this wafer in a dry ambient. Dry oxidation is performed. Okay. So thin oxide layer fills up the trenches, thin oxide, please remember this is thin, you can also say but nothing will grow above silicon nitride because silicon nitride does not oxidizes, okay. So all the trench edges now are filled up with thin oxide, okay. Typically this thickness may be 100 Armstrong to 200 Armstrongs or 10 nanometer to 20 nanometers if you want nanometers. After this initial dry oxide is done, then you may go for weight oxidation and that weight cycle will be how much? Again dry, weight, dry. So the first dry is this, the next is weight dry cycle ahead. But that will be very thin, I mean weight will still take time because this is a trench which is to be filled up now. So I do not use any growth techniques now. So what do I do? I dump, that is I deposit silicon dioxide from the top. Is that correct? This is a oxide deposition process, not growth process. Is that clear? So I deposit silicon dioxide from the top such that and it is a gaseous system so gases goes down everywhere, nitride does not allow oxygen to go through. So it fills up all the trenches with oxides, it follows the contours. Okay. 
However, on the surface I did not show you properly, you will see this because the thickness proportionality will be seen on the surface. Okay. Done karenge na, to yaha par jada hai aur yaha to yeh thoda niche chala jayega. You got it? This is deeper, this is not deeper. So, it will actually show some one portion higher than slightly lower. The reason is this, this thickness which is growing over this is not same as this. Deposition rate is same everywhere, but since you are going through, the time taken to grow this should be same as time taken to deposit this. Point is, with the SIO2 not uh, diffused uh, through the lateral walls into the? The deposition process is ionic, okay. it is not just LPCVD, okay. it is RF depositions, it will just go down, okay. just go down. Even if it does, but silicon nitride is very thick, okay. so. No, no, no. This way deposition laterally is very difficult because you are depositing. Na? Growth, if it is a growth, yes, it will enter, but there is no growth here. You are just pushing gas down. Okay. So, it goes like this. Okay. So, this is a non planar surface is seen okay. and this non planar surface I can make planarize by using a process which is called chemical mechanical CMP is polish. What is the word I use? Chemical, mechanical, polish, CMP, which is the most important process step these days in almost all CMOS processes. Okay. We keep planarizing the wafer every now and then. Okay. What is chemical, mechanical, polish? You take the wafers, put it on a chemical, on a uh, chuck which has some mechanical slurry like aluminum oxide and you put some chemical on that and you keep rotating in 8 direction, 8 forming an 8. So, it HS partly and scrubs partly, scrubs partly, HS partly. So, you get chemical mechanical polish and as fine the powder you take, final is the polish. Okay. Polish means, what is polish word? Surface is planar as is very best polish means non completely uniform plane. So, how much I remove? I will remove just above nitride kind, just above. I can keep watching when it comes. You have drawn the figure, the last sheet for the day. Please remember, etching the CMP hoga the wafer, yadi aisa hai, to aisa, aisa hai etch karenge. Actually, grind kya ja hai. Okay. Is it okay? Is it figure okay? So, here is the final this STI has seen. I removed now all that non planar, planar everything has been taken care by single plane because polish will come on single plane. There is a nitride, there is oxide, this, and there is an STI. Okay. This is called recessing because it now fits to the surface, it is called recess. Anything which is fitting with the surface is called recess. Upar hai nahi hai recess. Ye recess ho hai. So, this is recessed oxide. This is trench isolations. So, where are the active regions now? These are the active transistor areas. They are separated by trenched silicon dioxide, the wave P well, everything will be much below uh, only in smaller areas. So, nothing this transistor can interact with this transistor any way, okay. is that okay? So, STI is a very standard process nowadays, CMP is a major processing step nowadays and therefore, this is very, very crucial in making any chips these days. Is it okay? So, so far out of 16 masks, how many masks we have done? One. So, imagine there are 15 more masks to go through if the minimum C mass to be shown. Okay. So, something I will hurry up, something I will show, I thought that this is first time I am showing you. So, how we actually keep doing things. 
So, all process steps I shown you everything in between there I will show okay, next I do this and I will get this okay, because you know you have seen once okay. is that okay. So far I have shown you every process step in between how it will happen but next time I will say here to here I can come okay, you look think of it see you then.